everybody, Terrence Pop here with another episode from the lair. And uh, I think we covered most, if not all, of the jump stories. I know there's more out there, I just didn't come to mind. You know, maybe I'll have some more once I get reminded of some stuff. But now we're getting to get into some of the meat and potatoes, you know, some of the stories that uh, took place, you know, while I was in Second Ranger Battalion. Yeah, there was some crazy ass shit that went on there. So, the one that comes to mind is, uh, I don't know how the new Ranger compound is on Fort Lewis, but in the old days he had the four buildings with the defect, and then there's a fence that goes around the whole way. And it opens up in four places that goes into the main parking lot in front of each one of the buildings. And on the fence, on signs, pretty much every 50 meters, it says, warning, restricted area, stay out. I mean, it, it, does, it doesn't get any easier than that to, you know, say, hey, this is not a place you want to go fucking around in. So, usually the gates are open all the time unless they're locked down on alert, then, then you know, that's another story. But this, uh, this particular one took place after Panama, and, uh, you know, we had some, a lot of guys get injured in Panama, including me. Uh, some guys got it much worse. Uh, we had one guy, I'm not going to say his name, I think we called we call him Stretch, something like that. That was his nickname. But uh, he had broke his femur, and uh, he broke the femur away from the head of the hip bone, and he had uh, bolts, screws, and a, and a rod in there, uh, and his leg was healing up. And he only had like six months left to go, so they weren't going to send him down the road to Legoland, you know. We, we were, you know, I guess we took care of our own in that instance. Uh, and yeah, he was on crutches, and you know, it is what it is. You know, war does that. Uh, but anyway, you know, he was down the Madigan Club, uh, drinking, running his mouth, doing his deal. And this particular soldier, he had a knack for just verbally fucking with you. He was really good at it. And apparently, you know, these, uh, these guys in Madigan <clears throat> were fucking with him back. And one of them was a civilian. Uh, I don't know what, why that guy was on Fort Lewis. But uh, he leaves, gets in a cab. He's heading back towards the range battalion. Now these three other fuckers, they're, they're not satisfied, so they get in their car and they follow him back to the battalion. So he goes, you know, the, the cab drops him off in the parking lot and these these three guys drive in behind the cab. The cab drives off. You know, and, and these three dudes didn't read the signs, you know, saying, hey, this is a restricted area, blah, blah, blah. So these three guys commence to beating the shit out of a dude on crutches, who is an airborne ranger who's wounded in Panama. And they're doing this in the parking lot right outside the barracks of Bravo Company. Well, lo and behold, you can see that parking lot from the day room. So apparently some guys are up there shooting pool. I know the two guys, I'm not gonna say their names, but uh, they run down as fast as they can outside. There was no talking, there was no negotiating. These three guys got waylaid, like beat down hard, like fractured orbitals of, of the skull, teeth knocked out, you know, bent fingers. I mean, it was, it was fucking ugly. Blood everywhere. Uh, and I didn't hear about this when it happened. This, this went down somewhere around 12.30, 1 in the morning. I was asleep. I was in my room. One of the guys who's a close personal friend of mine who was involved in all this, because, you know, he had been drinking a little bit, a little bit. He didn't know how it was going to shake out, so I let him rack out in my room and, until, you know, it blew over. Because it's one thing if you're, you know, some crazy shit goes down and it's self-defense. But the minute you have alcohol on your breath or you've been drinking, it's an alcohol-related incident and it goes to a whole other level of stupid. You know, chain of command gets involved and people get kicked out and court-martialed. It's crazy. You know, I don't really think anything of it. You know, next morning we get up, we're going to go do PT. And this is one of those rare nights that it actually snowed just a little titty bit at Fort Lewis. So we're outside, you know, it was squad PT as a squad. We're stretching out, doing our calisthenics. And we're, we're, you know, basically when we're done with that, we're going out to do our, I think we're running three miles that day. And I walk by on the parking lot and I see as plain as day a bank of teeth, three molars with the meat still attached, everything laying right there in the fucking snow. 
So some motherfucker got pretty much all of his fucking wisdom teeth and, and, and molar teeth knocked out of his fucking, out of his face. It probably broke his jaw too. What are you gonna do? So Monday, the commander got called by the MPs uh, stating that uh, a civilian uh, was severely injured in the parking lot outside of Bravo Company. And uh, one, one a guy was enlisted Air Force and one guy was enlisted Army that was with him. He should have knew better. So, I, you know, it, and then I never heard anything of it again. And this is like two or three weeks later. I'm on CQ, right? So basically, I'm watching the desk. You take over at 9 in the morning, and it goes till 9 the next morning. It's a 24-hour thing. Okay, and this is during the week, which are pretty much shitty, shitty rotations. If you're going to get CQ, the best one to get is Friday or Saturday night because you, you see the best shit, and you make money doing that because uh, extortion works. That's another story. We'll get to that. So I'm at the desk, and these two CID agents come in, and they're in plain clothes. And I'm like, hey, whoa, 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 whoa. What's going on here? And they're like, oh, we want to talk to your commander. And I'm like, okay. All right, you, well, you can go wait in the day room over there, and I'll get the commander let him know you're here, and can I have your names? And, they're, and they, like, try to blow past me. I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. I'm, I'm in charge here. This is CQ. You're at the desk. People just don't walk around in here. You know, it's, you know, just go in the day room. And, and these guys were being dicks. So I'm like, okay. And then by this time, we'd attracted about six or eight rangers. And I remember, because where the desk was, you could look up the stairwell right there in Bravo Company. And there's like six guys there and four guys filtering down. And, and they're all just like holding their spit spittoons. And they're like, these are all airborne rangers. All right. So I'm like, yo, oh, these dudes leave the desk. Waylay their fucking asses and throw them out on your face. And they're like, Roger that. And they fucking come down there and they surround these two dudes. I go and tell the commander, I'm like, hey, I got two CID guys out here and they want to talk to you. You know, I'm going to send them to the day room. He's like, Roger that. And I come out and I'm like, okay, you know, go to the day room. The guy pulls out his ID. He goes, I'm Sergeant First Class such and such. I'm a CID agent. I look at it and hand it back and I'm like, Roger that, Sergeant. Go wait in the fucking day room. <laughs> and I think the commander had him in there for like a half an hour before he called him into his office. And uh, since I was right there, you know, I'm literally standing outside the door listening to the whole thing. And the commander, was he handled this graciously. It was hilarious. So the CID guys come in there and they're like, all right, two rangers came down from your building or from one of the buildings here and attacked these three people in your parking lot. And I'm like, you know, my commander is like, okay. Uh, do you have a description? Well, we have a rough description. Uh, somewhere between five foot nine and six feet, white with brown hair. My commander looks at him. You know what, I, th I think we should go see the battalion commander and we should line up the entire battalion and you can just go through uh, and pick from all the hundreds and hundreds of people that we have that are between that height with brown hair and then you can pick out the couple of guys who actually did this beat down. Oh, and on a side note, why the fuck were they in this compound when they shouldn't be here, when there's signs clearly marking that this is a restricted area, and they were assaulting an airborne ranger who was wounded in Panama just waiting to, you know, ETS from the army? Can you explain that to me? Well, that was about it. The agents, like, walked out, and it was never heard of again. Totally done. <laughs> fuck those guys. Yeah, you're gonna do some stupid ass shit like that, you're gonna get a fucking beat down. Alright, now, when I got promoted, you know, to E5, and I moved down into the NCO uh, quarters, which is downstairs on the first floor, I did not really know what was going on, but apparently I had been promoted and moved into a active practical joke war zone. Uh, the amount of fuckery that was going on was amazing. And it was absolutely hilarious. And on a side note, it was done basically to, um, you know, keep people from going crazy. You know, a lot of people don't seem to understand, like, when you're in the range battalion, that is all you do 24-7, you know, 355 days a year. Because 10 days, you know, you're home for Christmas, block leaving shit. You train for war. You prepare for war. All you do is, you know, clean your equipment. Practice with your equipment, do your drills, your SOPs, use your weapons. I mean, that's all you do. 
And in the morning you do PT, which is insane, off the hook hard. You know, and if you fall out of like two or three runs, you're kicked out of the battalion. All right, you fall out of two road marches, you're out of the battalion. Okay, that's it. You know, unless there's injuries or extenuating circumstances, you know, they're just gonna say, hey, you can't maintain the standard, sorry. Um, you're going back down the leg land, sorry. So, I mean, that's a lot of fucking pressure. So these guys, you know, they handle it, you know, I, I would say, you know, from my perspective, in a very healthy way. Like, for instance, you know, your doorknob covered with Vicks Vapor Rub. You know, you, you get up in the morning, you come out there, you know, do something down the hall and come back and, ugh. Or, uh, for instance, somebody uh, broke into my room one day and liquid nailed all of my footwear to uh, the floor, which was... Uh, hard to undo because I basically had to rip it up uh, which ripped the tiles off of the floor and then chisel the fucking shit off the soles of my boots go to the, the R&U you know, the r &U room which was basically a, a closet get more fucking tiles put the fucking paste on them, stick them down there and then put a sandbag on there so they were dry and then you have you know, the tiles, they all look a certain color and then you got the new ones that are all fucked up and if you have an inspection, you might have to explain that. And it's kind of weird when three or four of the tiles where your foot gear is supposed to be under your bed are gone. It is what it is. You know, and I used to go fuck with a guy, one of the NCOs, a couple of floors down, or a couple of rooms down from me. After PT, I would pick the lock on his door, go in there and, and you know, smash the stink bomb in his room. I did it like two or three times a week for months. Drove him absolutely fucking crazy. And thank God they didn't have those nanny cams back then because I would have been busted fucking three ways to Sunday. You know, we, we did shit like that all the time. Put motor oil on the guy's fucking floor out in front of his room. And, uh, you know, coming out from PT, watch him slip and fall on the ground. And, and then he has to clean it up because, you know, nobody's going to fess up to it. I probably have 20 or 50 fucking, you know, funny-ass stories. And I remember one of the NCOs that, you know, he and I were in a pretty good joke war. Um... I got the last laugh because, you know, he was ETSing. Uh, he was going back to Oklahoma. I had gone to the Seattle, you know, uh, seafood market, and I bought this fish. I, I don't even know what it was. It was, big, it was about this big. Had it in the trunk of my car. And uh, he was leaving on Sunday. I got the fish on Saturday. Uh, Sunday, his car's all loaded up, you know. He's going around saying his last goodbyes. And the back of his car, you know, he left the hatchback open. I remember I went in there and I moved some of his shit aside and I put this big fucking fish in there and I put the rest of his shit on top of it. And then I shook his hand like, hey, see you later, man. It's all good. Uh, good happy trails, hope you have a good life. Uh, stay out of jail, don't kill anybody. And uh, if you fight, don't go to the ground because it never ends well. And he drove off. And I heard from that guy like a decade and a half later that, uh, you know, he didn't find that shit till he made it home and it stunk his car up three ways on Sunday. <laughs> Winning! Ah, <laughs> oh, the practical joke wars. That's fucking good stuff right there. Here's another one here. Now, this, this guy was kind of a dick. All right. He got promoted to E5 like literally seven days before me. All right. So, you know... When you're, we didn't have you know, pagers or cell phones back in the day. I mean, pagers were just coming on the scene. And the only really people that had pagers was like the first sergeant, the platoon sergeants, and a couple of squad leaders. Everyone else, if they wanted to have one, they had to buy their own or pay for it themselves, which back then was fucking expensive as hell. So, you know, to negate that, you're supposed to call in. If you're away from the barracks, if you're on RF1, you have to call in every four to six hours to find out what's going on. So it's Saturday, I'm out, you know, at some girl's house, I don't remember her name, it's not relevant. And I'm trying to call the barracks, it's fucking busy. All right, so finally I get through and I'm like, yo, what the fuck's going on? The phone's been busy forever. Well, this particular sergeant was talking to his girlfriend or something and had the line tied up for hours. Well, he thought I was an officer or something, so he's like, oh, sorry, sir. I'm like, no, dude, dude, this is me, Pop, I, I, I'm just... You know, don't worry about it. It's just, you know, you can't have the line tied up for this long, you know? And he fucking goes off the deep end. You know, fuck you. You come in here right fucking now. And I'm like, dude, dude, 
do. You're the CQ. You're in charge of quarters. I'm not in the quarters right now. I'm off post. It's Saturday night. I've been drinking and I'm not driving my car in there drunk. So I'll see you tomorrow. There you go. Well, this fucker, you know, the CQ's got the keys to everyone's fucking room. So he goes into my room, opens up my wall locker, dumps everything on the floor, to include my boots, my dress greens, pours a gallon of milk on all of my shit, and then pours the protein powder I had next to the mil or next to the little refrigerator where I used to make my protein shakes I'd drink, you know, one or two a day. And then leaves. Oh, and he also uh, took my fucking 357 Magnum, Smith & Wesson Model 19, and gave it to my squad leader. Uh, actually, yeah, I gave it to my section leader, actually. And uh, there's nothing I can do. Because, you know, all you got to say is uh, Pop had a gun in his room, and I'm fucked. So I had to, like, pay for all the dry cleaning and unfuck the entire fucking mess. Uh, and, like, two days later, we had a, you know, open barracks inspection. So... That was not cool. And then he was a raging fucking dick about it. Rub your face in it forever. Okay, so this guy leaves the unit, goes over to the airfield because he wants to be a crew chief and fly in helicopters, which is cool. You know, and in fact, he became a one of those medics um, that flies on the helicopters. It's a first responder or whatever, I don't know. Because uh, he did have a, I think he had an MOS in supply and he was a medic. So it was a good fit for him, I guess. So, you know, this is, you know, I've already done SFAS and I'm ETSing from the Army. So, I, you know, and I know where this guy fucking lives at. And he has one of these hot rod cars. I used to race them. And I used to think we were tight back in the day before we did this shit. So, you know, I pack up my shit, sign out of the barracks, clear post. It's my last fucking afternoon there. I hang out till, you know, I think it was a Thursday night. Hang around till. 8.30 in the evening, you know, I went to the hardware store and I got uh, one of those pans uh, where you can put the roller in. Well, I bought a roller and I put it on the end of a broomstick that I purchased. And I went to his car and he used to have, um, it's not a GTO, it's something very, it looks really close to it, but it's not. It was all tricked out, you know. He had the, uh, the sway bars on it and he had... The back was tubbed. I mean, it was for, it was rigged up for, for basically driving, you know, a quarter mile. You know, it's pretty fat. It was a duster. That was it. It was a duster. You know, great paint job, the whole deal. Uh, and he had a car alarm on it. You know, I don't care. Fuck him. So, I'll put the pan down. Take the paint. This is oil based paint. This is not like latex wash off of the hose paint. Fucking. Put it in there. And I take a little fucking uh, bottle of paint remover. It's like this it's like this jelly kind of shit. Put it in there. Hook up the roller. Put it in there. Walk up to the front of the car and I just start rolling this yellow fucking stripe right down the middle of this fucking car. And the car alarm didn't really go off until I was standing on top of his car, you know, painting the stripe on the top of his car down the back when then it started going off. Well, he lived on the third floor in this apartment, and I can see his, like, balcony. So he opens the door, he comes out, and he's like, Motherfucker, you fucking piece of shit. Blah, blah. I'm just like, fuck you. You fuck with me, I fuck with you, bitch. I get in my car, I-5, I'm gone. That's it. Never saw that motherfucker again. Fuck him. Hey, listen. You want to be fucking vicious and ruthless? You want to fuck with people? Well, guess what? Fucking goes both ways. So, you guys out there listening to this, remember that. Be careful if you fuck with the wrong people, because uh, it might come back to bite you in the ass. Anyway, I hope you like these stories. Have a good evening.